came first. Good evening and welcome to the College of Complexes. We're starting about 40 minutes late due to yours truly getting stuck in traffic and having a few equipment problems. But we will, we will have a good show. Tonight we're going to have a presentation on the centrist party. A couple brief reminders about the College of Complex and its format. The first, the college consists of three various formats. The first is our speaker will speak. The second part is that we will have a question and answer period where we will entertain questions and not speeches. And the third parts are rebuttals and you'll be able to speak. The speaker will get the last word. Matthew Geiger, Chicago lead, Chicago centrist, a group made up of people who have felt let down by both political parties and the influence of money in politics. A look at bipartisanship, gerrymandering, and for unresponsive system. They are concerned about the increasing, the increasing extremism within political parties and, the, and had the following out of politics center. The centrist project aims strategically to elect independent candidates through two to office who can break through po political gridlock and serve as a voice for those in the sensible center. Not as a traditional third party, but as America's first unparty. Their fulcrum strategy is located on electing a sufficient number of these candidates to closely divided legislatures like the U.S. Senate where, as a swing coalition, they can deny both parties an outright majority to use their dis proportionate influence to force real solutions. Let us again welcome Matthew Geiger. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for, uh, for having me, giving me the time, and for, for listening to everything that Centrist Project is up to and, and our views. And, um, Hopefully, hopefully you share some of them, and I'll I'll get into explaining the whole idea of the uh, the unparty and everything we're about. But I just want to start by explaining a bit. Cue me when you're ready. Okay. Uh, why? Uh, who I am? My background? What brought me here? Um, so um, I'm Matt Geiger. I am the Chicago chapter lead of the Centrist Project. So. I basically um, am running the grassroots movement here in Chicago, getting people and trying to get independent centrists elected to office and also uh, a lot of other reforms that we stand for. Um, my background is, is not really in politics or anything like that. It's all finance and accounting, but I was really frustrated like a lot of people after the last election. and so. I said, you know, I can't just sit back and complain about it. I need to actually get out there and do something. So I left my full-time job, moved to a job that would let me work part-time and flexibly so I could do a lot of things that I was passionate about. And one of them is actually this, the Centrist Project. So I've been doing a lot around the Centrist Project to grow its presence around Chicago. Go to the next slide. So I'll explain a little bit more about what, Chica what Centrist Project is in general, but I just want to start with the same thing that really frustrated me and got me to act, because it's the same thing that gave birth to the Centrist Project as a whole. Um, in general, if you look around, there is just total political dysfunction, and you can see it at every level. You can see it at the federal level, you see it all around Illinois, for sure, um, and then even in Chicago. I mean, in, you see it on a whole bunch of different levels. I mean, you look financially, we are in debt at every level. Illinois and Chicago specifically, we've got crippling debt. We've got a lot of policies that we need to just do something about. I mean, look at Social Security and Medicare, which, you know, if we just let them go on their path, they're going to be insolvent within my lifetime. Um, on the other hand, you've also got things like climate change, which are clearly issues, um, but we're not always telling the truth about them. We're not always, we're not always um, being honest about what needs to be done, and therefore we're just kind of letting it get worse and worse and worse. So there's a lot of these things that, in general, just reflect a total inability to govern in general. And because of that, things are just getting worse. A lot of these cases 
any solution would be better than inaction, but instead that's what we get, inaction. And so um, that's really led to some serious dissatisfaction. Um, so go to the next slide. So on, on the next slide we've got basically just showing satisfaction over the years. Uh, there's a pretty solid trend downward, just a total lack of faith in our government over time. It's only getting worse. Um, you know, a, a lot of people will look at this and they'll, they'll blame a political party um, or they'll blame Donald Trump. Um, and people in the Centrist Project do not like Donald Trump, but at the same time we look at people like Donald Trump and we look at both political parties and we really see them as reflections of a broken system. We don't, we don't blame one or the other, we don't blame one person. We think that these things happen because of a flawed system. And I think you can really see that pretty obviously within the political parties um, and just how they haven't delivered over the years. And you know, I don't, I don't want to bash either political party. Uh, I want to bash both political parties. <coughs> so, you know, you look. I mean, well, a good example. You look at the Republicans now. You know, they they control all the houses, yet they still can't get through what they want to do. You know, it just. It, it doesn't, it doesn't seem to make much sense. And you see it the other way too. I mean, you look at Illinois, where the Democrats, more often than not, control the, the governor's seats and the House and the Senate. But you know, they haven't done a lot of things that they said they were gonna do over the years. And I'm, I'm not talking about things like fixing the debt even. I'm talking about things that are clearly uh, Thank you. Thank you. democratic things like, um, like you know, the fight for $15 minimum wage or, you know, uh, or racial inequality, so things like that that just don't seem to get done regardless of who's in power. So we believe that really points to systemic problems, not problems with one party or the other, or one person, or Donald Trump. And so we think that systemic problems need to be addressed with systemic solutions. So, oh, you know, and as far as those systemic problems, I want to get into those a bit more. So. Specifically, we see three main systemic problems that's leading to a lot of the problems with both political parties. Uh, the first one is just a broken primary process. So, you know, you look at, first of all, who turns out for primaries? It's the most extreme parts of both parties. So what's going to happen? Well, you're going to elect, you're going to put up the most extreme factions of each side. And so that's what you get. You get a lot of candidates who are far apart in ideology, and then you're forced to choose. That The middle is completely hollowed out. But then on top of that, you've got another problem. You've got money in politics, and specifically, you've got money within the political parties. So the most ideologically pure people among the Republicans and Democrats can't deviate from the places that they get their money. And you know, a lot of people like to demonize Republicans for the money in politics, and uh, they deserve a lot of blame, but they're not the only one. Democrats also get a lot of money from a lot of groups. And then the, thir the third thing that we think is a systemic problem that's creating a lot of these messes are just um, that the two political parties are systemically suppressing new ideas. And they do this a number of ways. The most common is gerrymandering, where they just kind of shape the districts however they want to make sure either they get certain one party gets certain rep representation or to make sure their seats are safe. Um, also they do things like creating really burdensome signature requirements for anyone who wants to run outside of the two parties so no one even has a chance to run as something more moderate. And then on top of that things in general like the Electoral College for example basically makes certain that no, no one running outside the two parties ever really has a chance. So, uh, now, oh, sorry, stay on the slide. So, because of all this stuff, we put together what we believe is the best solution. Basically, we were looking for a way where it wouldn't take a lot of money, it wouldn't necessarily take a ton of people, but we could still make a difference to try to um, either look for common ground, look for common sense solutions, actually just getting things done in general so that it's not two ideologically pure groups just kind of butting heads constantly. And so what we came up with is basically trying to elect 
three to five centrist independent candidates to the U.S. Senate. Um, if, if you can go to the next slide. This is what we call the fulcrum strategy. The idea behind the fulcrum strategy is that we control just a few seats, so three to five seats as I said, but by doing that you deny either party the majority. So if anyone wants to get anything done, they have to come and they have to work with the middle. And that way, the people who are the most moderate, the people who are actually willing to work together, will be the ones who come to the table with the centrists. Otherwise, nothing's going to get done. So basically, we just want to prevent a lot of what we're seeing. So for example, right now, the Republican Party trying to get rid of Obamacare. You've got really the Republican Party just trying to rope in their most extreme people to make sure that there's just a Republican-only solution. I mean, I think we know how that story ends. Uh, not well. So if we had the fulcrum strategy in place here, you have the most moderate people coming to the table with the centrists with something that's actually going to improve the country. I mean, and even whether it came from the left or the right, it wouldn't matter. I mean, even Democrats have admitted that there are lots of things we can do to improve Obamacare. So another thing about this is that when you have people in the, the middle, because the right and the left are so tied to these old allegiances that provide them with money, people in the middle aren't tied to those allegiances and so they don't have this financial incentive so they can bring up a lot of things that the moneyed interests don't want brought up right now so um, you know things like well for example getting money out of politics in the first place no one seems too interested in doing that right now if you have people in the middle though where that's basically their platform they could actually do that and so you know, I know a lot of people are, um, if you go to the next slide, a lot of people are really skeptical of this idea. They think that it's, they either think it's too difficult, you can't overcome the powers that are in place already, or it's just not going to happen. Um, and so there's a couple things about that. The first thing is that, you know, if, if, if you're trying to elect centrists nationwide, I totally agree. It's, it's, extremely difficult. We don't have the money, we don't have the people, um, we don't have the, <coughs> just in general, the, um, the support ideologically. But the thing is, we don't need it. If we're going for only three to five seats, and we're going for the Senate, you can pick out only a couple states that you need. So, for example, I mean, you look at Maine. Maine already has a centrist independent senator. So there's already one. You know, you look at a lot of other states, there's a lot of very independent states out there. I know Colorado is another one that we're specifically looking at, because it has a lot of independents, a lot of moderate Democrats and Republicans. So we don't have to look everywhere. Another thing, too, is you know, a lot of these barriers have been put up by the Democrats and the Republicans to make sure they stay in power. But we have been able to sort of hack the system and use a lot of those things to our advantage. So one is money. You need money to win elections. And you'd think that works against us, but what we can do is we can raise money and we can funnel it all into one specific state. And since every state has two senators, regardless of its size, we're not going to compete in a state like New York or, you know, but we can look at smaller states where we can actually funnel the money and actually have a chance and compete in the, on the money side of things too. <coughs> and also, if we're going for the Senate, you can't gerrymander states as a whole, so there's no way for them to. Uh, to impede us that way either. And then the other thing, aside from sort of hacking the system, is that we already basically have a proof of concept in the Alaska House. So in 2016, Alaska actually did elect two independents to its house. And so for a long time running up to this, it was always controlled by the far right Republicans. Um, they were having some serious budget issues. When they got two independents elected, what they did was they formed a coalition with the Democrats and the moderate Republicans. They were able to put together one more than a majority and basically control the process and take care of a lot of their problems that they'd been neglecting. So, I mean, this has been shown to work already, given it's Alaska, but we've already got other states on our sites that we can make a serious run in this upcoming election. And one, like I mentioned, is Colorado, um, but there are other states, too, that we're looking at. And so, you know, I, if, 
Uh, next slide, please. And so I, I still really haven't explained what the Centrist Project is. Um, it is not a third party. You know, it's not it's it's not the the centrist party. It's the centrist project, and we we call ourselves an unparty. So it's a few things. First of all, it's you know, if somebody wants to run right now as an independent, what do they have? Nothing. They don't have know-how. They don't have money. They don't have supporters. They don't have a platform. They have nothing. So what we're trying to do is build that infrastructure. We want to build the infrastructure for independence the same way that the Republicans and the Democrats have been having infrastructure. So that when someone wants to run as an independent centrist, they go out there. They've got people they can tap. They've got a grassroots organization that can help knock on doors and get signatures. They've got people they know where to go to for money. Um, they've got an organization that knows what they're doing, who've run other campaigns. They know the people who can go out and be campaign managers, things like that. So that people, if people want to run, they actually stand a chance. The second thing is just a network of voters in general. So one thing that we've done, and the, what I'm really trying to do, is putting together these grassroots movements across the country. So for example, we've got one in Chicago that I'm helping grow. And that's really to get the people, to get the supporters, to get the ideas out there, so that when independents come up who are running for office, we have people who can go out there and knock on doors, collect signatures, um, just in general help with the campaign, or you know, just vote for these people because they realize they actually have a chance at winning. And then the third thing, as I alluded to a bit earlier, was just it's just an electoral hack to the system. So a way a way that we can break through a lot of this political dysfunction, so that we can get people talking again, get people working together again, because if, because there's no other way effectively. And so, you know, a lot of people ask us what we believe, and it's, it's a bit of a tricky question because, you know, a lot of times people are expecting very specific answers, you know, what do we believe? Um, but the truth is, since we're working with independents, we really leave that up to every individual to decide what their stances are, but we do have some guardrails, and so that's what these are. One is fiscal responsibility. You know, I talked to, a lot of these, by the way, seem very obvious. Well, of, of course you should be fiscally responsible. But, you know, I, um, I spoke with Amaya Pawar's uh, campaign manager, and, you know, he's listing all these, all these social programs. And they're all great. I mean, I, I like them all, but I was like, well, how, how much is this going to cost? How are you going to pay for it? So, Tax oh, the rich. You know, well, yeah, right. Well, he didn't. They didn't say that. And I mean, and I, if you know, if if you've got if you've got a plan for being fiscally responsible, that's fine. You know, it, it could be tax the rich. You know, or it could go the other way. The, the point is, though, you obviously need ways to be fiscally responsible. The second thing is good governance, obviously. But what? The, so what does that include? Things like getting rid of gerrymandering. Things like getting money out of politics, or at least, you know, if, if you can't get money out of politics, at least reducing the impact of money in politics. Um, so just in general, things like that. Economic opportunity, which for us means a couple things. One is to have strong social safety nets to protect people who have fallen so that they can actually rise back up the economic ladder. But also we believe in the free market and capitalism, so it includes that too. Social tolerance in general, just, you know, things like, LGBTQ rights, and then environmental responsibility, which is just sort of having some sort of plan, some sort of idea, uh, some sort of understanding of what the science on climate change is telling us, an idea for how we deal with that. And then just in general, there, there are, those are more of the guardrails around developing policy, but also we have individual guardrails around just how we, how we operate, how we work, I mean, and these are just obvious, but they're not happening now. Putting your country before your own political party. I mean, do I need to give you any examples of this one? I mean, following the facts. <laughs> following the facts, cooperation over conflict. I mean, just being able to work together in general. Being able to, understanding that sometimes doing nothing is the worst solution. And I mean, a good example of that, if you follow Illinois, we haven't had a we haven't had a budget. We, I mean, we got one now, but we haven't had a budget for two years, yes. almost three. So, I mean, clear example. Clearly, not having a budget 
is the worst outcome. And that's what we got because we weren't able to work together. Um, and then, you know, I know a, a lot of people are, are up on everything at the federal level. Um, I know, you know, I, I know you guys are all very learned and you follow a lot of this, um, but for, for people who, who don't follow Illinois quite as much, I just put a few headlines to show uh, how dysfunctional Illinois is. Okay, next. Um, uh, yep, that's it. So just let's, this, this top Illinois House Senate played political games on constitutional amendments. So I believe that's one where the House and the Senate passed slightly different versions of a bill so that they can all go back to the, this, this was around eliminating gerrymandering. Um, and then they never got together to reconcile, so it never became law to get rid of gerrymandering. But everyone can go back to their districts and say, yeah, we voted for this. So somehow that's how everyone can vote for eliminating gerrymandering. Yeah, we still have gerrymandering. Uh, political disagreements in Illinois foil budget agreement. I, mean, I already talked about the, the whole budget mess. Um, which, thank goodness, we, we finally took care of, regardless of whether you agree with the outcome or not. It's better than no budget at all. Um, and then Illinois government dysfunction by incompetence or by design. That's where they, um, they passed laws to help fix our pension messes, basically knowing full well that the Supreme Court would shoot down what they did. That way they could say they're trying to be fiscally responsible and really they're not. And so we have a strategy to combat a lot of this in Illinois. This, this, is, um, this is Illinois specific. This is our Chicago chapter specific. This isn't the, the centrist project as a whole. But basically, we have, we have two prongs of it. The first one is electing independence to the Illinois House. And the reason we're focusing on the Illinois House, like, like at the federal level, where we're trying to rely on sort of hacks to get in, we're doing the same with, with the Illinois House. So, so many of our districts are badly gerrymandered in Illinois. Um, I, I voted in, um, I've, I've moved around a lot in the last few years, and so I've, I've voted in a few different districts, and I've never had the opportunity to vote in a contested race for the Illinois House, regardless of where I lived. Um, so, so many districts are horribly gerrymandered, so what you usually end up with is a district that is um, you know has a lot of disaffected uh, minority voters, not not minorities in in the uh, ethnic sense, but in the political sense. So what we want to do is run a centrist in those districts, so that you know effectively, let's say let's say the district is 65 percent Republican, for example, and you run you've got a Republican running and a centrist independent, you automatically have 35 percent of the people who are going to vote for them. And then all you need to do is really convert another 15% of the more moderate Republicans onto your side, and you've got a competitive race. And, and I think right now, is there's no better time to do it. I talk to some people who say, yeah, I'm a, I'm a Republican, I'm a Democrat, but I'm so fed up with what's going on, I just don't want to vote for the incumbent. The other thing is supporting a Chicago mayoral candidate who agrees with, who falls within the guardrails of our principal values. So I don't know if you guys are aware, but the Chicago mayor does not run with a party. It's all, it's all no, there's no parties involved. So I think that's a good opportunity to get behind somebody. Um, if you live in yeah. Chicago, you probably know that Rahm Emanuel is probably in some trouble this upcoming election. And there's a lot of good qualified candidates out there who I, I think would do a really good job. So we'd like to back one of them. And, um, and hopefully they win. Go knock on doors from, uh, for them and just help them out. So that's, that's really who we are, what we're trying to do. Um, you know, I've just got a few call to actions here. So one, you know, if, if you have any interest in what I've been talking about, if you're just frustrated with the system, we have Republicans, we have Democrats, we have Libertarians, we have Progressives. I mean, even though we are centrist independents at heart, a lot of what we say, a lot of people agree with. I've gone and talked to other groups, I've gone to Bernie supporters, I've gone to libertarian groups and spoken, and they all say, you know what, we're not 100% agreeing with you on all the specific issues and the guardrails, but we agree with the general things of you know, getting money out of politics, um, fixing a lot of these structural problems. And a lot of the structural problems we need to fix are going to help 
a lot of different groups who are not the you know the hardcore Republicans or the hardcore Democrats. And then the second the second thing you can do is just join our Facebook group. We also have a Facebook page and engage with the community of us. And then the third thing, uh, we've got a meetup group, so if you want to find out about our other events, check it out, sign up, and you'll get all sorts of notifications about when our next events are. We usually get together about once a month um, just to talk to other people. Again, it's a whole bunch of different political affiliations. It's not just centrists. Um, so it's usually an interesting conversation because you have a lot of people who just want to get together and solve problems, you know, regardless of what political background they come from. Next slide. Okay. Sorry. And so this, the, so the guy, the guy who came up with all the principles that underlie the centrist project, his name is is Charlie Whelan, and he's a professor, and he also ran for office actually in Illinois. So he ran for office, and his story is he ran as a Democrat. He got up there and basically when they're looking for endorsements from all the different groups, they get the candidates up there one by one, they ask them some questions. Well, they were looking for endorsements from the Chicago Teachers Union and they asked him questions about pensions. And so his, even though he's a Democrat, his view was that our pensions are a mess in Illinois and he thought that the Chicago Teacher Union benefits should be more in line with the benefits that they get in the private sector. So the, the, the big one where, where that they didn't like was he wanted to, I believe he wanted to increase the age of retirement to more closer to the average age of someone who retires in the private sector. And so immediately though, I mean, you can imagine what happens. Chicago Teachers Union, thank you, you can go. And um, he never really had, had a chance of, of making it through the primary process. Yeah. So in response to that, he wrote a book about it, and he came up with a lot of the principles that, that the centrist project revolves around. And so this is a quote from him that I just think is really good in general, regardless of whether you agree or disagree with everything I've said. Uh, if the food's bad at your local Chinese restaurant, then yes, you should not spend any money there. The restaurant will either improve or it'll go out of business. Politics is the opposite. When sensible folks withdraw from the process, they leave a bigger role for the extremists who do show up. If it's broken, we have to fix it. And so, for that reason, thank you guys for showing up. Um, you know, regardless of where your views are at, you know, I think it's always good to just get discourse out there and talk about different ideas. So, thank you for having me. Right. We want to take questions. Andy, do you need a moderator or you just need to? No, just go ahead and start taking questions. That's, that's fine, yeah. All right. Uh, yep. Go ahead. We'll go, go ahead first. Here. Okay. Um, let, let me start for a minute with some of the, the data that's behind my question. The two major parties, the two national parties, are the right wing party, the right wing right wing party, and the lunatic right wing party. Uh, uh, um, Bill Clinton was far to the right of Richard Nixon, and Barack Obama is to the right of Bill Clinton. Fiscal responsibility is a Republican campaign slogan for screw the poor. So my basic question is, you keep using the word center, center of what? So, I mean, centrist is really, so some people, I think get the wrong idea that we are just trying to take the Republicans and the Democrats and sort of find a nice center ground. That's not necessarily the case. We just basically choose the best from both parties. So when I, when I say fiscal responsibility, I mean policies that are not created that will eventually bankrupt our country. Three quarters of the voters want single payer health care. Both parties are violently in opposition. How do you split the difference? Yeah, I mean, so, you know, we don't cover every issue. Like like I said, we don't get into a lot of the specifics. We we allow the independents who are running for office to a, lot of, uh, a lot of leeway to come up with their own policies. As long as they fall within the guardrails, if they, as long as they come up with, with a system that's financial, that's fiscally responsible, and, you know, falls within a lot of those other guardrails that we've got, 
then we would be willing to support it. So that's we're not we're not necessarily about coming up with policies on every issue. It's more creating an infrastructure for different ideas. The fraction of total federal income that comes from tax on businesses is less than half of what it was 50 years ago. Fiscal responsibility actually means jacking up corporate taxes. Okay. Yeah, I mean, I think we would, like you kind of said, I think we would define fiscal responsibility as programs and systems that are long-term sustainable. So something like, something, it's not Tax just, the it's, rich is sustainable. Okay, Neil, let's move on to another question. Yeah, and, yeah. yeah as, long, as long as it's, it's fiscally responsible, as long as it's long-term financially sustainable, okay. I think we could get behind something. All right. Are you uh, familiar with the IVI IPO? IVI IPO? Uh, Independent Voters of Illinois. Precinct organization. Independent Voters of Illinois. Are, uh, refresh my memory. Are, they, are you talking about the Independent Maps Amendment? Or is no, it something different? It's an uh, organization. Or, organization of independence for a long time in Illinois. Called Independent Voters of Illinois. Yeah. Okay. It's it's an organization that a couple people are involved with here. Okay. We'll we'll, we'll give you more info. Yeah, we'll have to we'll have to get together with them and see. <coughs> okay. Uh, yeah, go ahead. Uh, I was just wondering about your use of Alaska as a proof of concept. Alaska is a state that's got what seven eight hundred thousand people, which makes it smaller than most of the cities and most of the other states mm -hmm. in in the country, and it's a state in which. The people of Alaska pretty much all know each other. There was a great interview with, uh, I don't remember, it was, it was one of the Democratic uh, legislators, and she commented that Ted Stevens would come and talk to her. And Ted Stevens knows her parents, knows her grandparents. When she had a baby, Ted Stevens knew who the baby was named after. So bringing an independent in there. <clears throat> Where there's all the, which is smaller, smaller community, and there's ties between the people that are well outside the normal political realm. Is that really a valid yeah, place? Yeah, to I, I, I understand the, the, gist, the gist of your question. So, using that as a proof of concept, it's not necessarily the proof is not necessarily in the ability to elect independents. If the proof for that is in other states, we've done it in a, a whole bunch of other states. The proof for Alaska was more that. If you, the proof was more around the fulcrum strategy, the idea of if you can get a couple independents elected, then they can have um, a larger presence than their numbers would suggest, just by the ability to form coalitions, get people together, and prevent you know one party from just whacking everyone over the head with what they want to. But that's still a, that's still the ability to get everybody together from a fulcrum. It's still built in the case of Alaska on the fact that all of these people are going to have all of these personal relationships that may not exist in other states. Uh, are you talking about the actual legislators? Yeah, or? the actual people elected. Yeah, I, I think. I mean, I think the legis people within the legislature within a state have personal relationships too. And actually, I mean, I think you know that's that's an argument for the centrist project for independence, where effectively, you know. We, We've had a number of people come and talk to us who have been elected as independents. And what they say is they can effectively walk up to anybody and talk to them about a policy. They get a lot of people coming to them from both sides of the aisle, and they say, hey, you know, why? So the independent will say, hey, why did you come to me on this issue? This is not like one of my core issues. And they'll say, oh, well, you're an independent. We wanted an, you know, an independent behind this. So I think it just goes to show that independents have a much greater um, ability to form coalitions, work together, and get things done in general. Okay. Yeah, Charlie? Yeah, if, 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 I, if I want and deserve a $10 raise, and I go in and talk to the boss, and he says, no, you're only going to get a $5. According to the centrals, that's a wonderful thing. No, so kind of like I was saying before, the idea around centrist project isn't just moderation. You know, we're not, we're not trying to take two ideas and find the middle ground and say this is where things should be. It's more around choosing the pieces we like from both sides. 
And also, you know, on, and on top of that too, well, obviously, well, you know. Are you are you on my side for ten dollars? On the side that I don't get anything. Are you asking me if you deserve a five dollar raise, yeah, a ten dollar I mean, raise, or no raise? I don't know. I well, I think you're retired, so I'd say no raise. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. Uh, you said you got a, 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 I'm kind of vague on that. You said you got a local group. Uh, do they have some rules? Like, do you get together every month? Uh, are there memberships? Are there uh, rules uh, that you have at your your meeting? Uh, do you pay dues? Uh, yeah. Do you so expect them to people to work for your organization. So the, how does that work? So there's, there's yeah there's the national level and they have um, they have a set infrastructure they have bylaws they you know they have everything you know very professionally they have um, you know they have you know the executive directors and, and all that sort of stuff and for that one they do have we do have members of this project you know you can just go on the website. Uh, donate whatever you want on a monthly basis and you become a member I mean literally any amount you want um, at our at our local level we are giving a, we're given a lot of autonomy so the Chicago chapter we get together it ends up being about once a month sometimes it's more sometimes it's less if, if there's a reason to get together or a rally or a cause we feel passionate about um, we might get together more often if there's nothing going on we won't um, and, and it's a mix we have formal meetings where we'll go over you know what we're working on and things like that we have a lot of informal get-togethers too where we'll just go to a bar and, and chat for a bit I mean it, it really it, it runs the gambit gambit and it's really informal too so you know if people joined and they wanted to affect the direction of it it's it's pretty easy to know. and no there's no requirement that people come to X number of meetings or anything it's it's very informal we have a lot of people who just like being informed they they agree with the cause but they you know a lot of people so for example our meetings in the city we have a lot of people who live and work in the suburbs so you know obviously they're not going to come to meetings too often unless they happen to be out here for something uh, but they still want to know what's going on they agree with the cause and so they just want to be kept you know informed on what's happening so it but then we've got other people who come to everything they help out they're doing research on the side they're you know doing a lot of data analysis so I mean it's it's all over the place. Thank you. Does your uh, Chicago chapter have a website? Uh, the Chicago chapter does not have a website. We have a Facebook group and a Facebook page. Okay. Um, but if you go to the main Chica uh, Centrist Project website, okay, there's an there. area for chapters. Where is it at? Um, Wait, it needs, okay. Other local local chapters. Local, okay. local chapters. Just trying to get, show people what. Uh, yeah, and then if you had joined one today, I think you'll see. Try, oh, there, there it is. Yes, then you can see a map with all the chapters, and then if, if you if you zoom in there, Chicago should be. One. Yep, there we go, and that's me. And then if uh, when you sign up for that, I get an email, so I'll I'll respond and I'll add you to our email list. Uh, if you're worried about too many emails. I, I make a note to absolutely never send out more than one email a week. So you might get less than that, you won't get more. Yeah. You got a question? Yeah. Uh, could you give me an idea of some uh, left-wing democratic ideas that your group would support? Yeah, sure. Uh, let me go back to... So, I mean, one... Or candidates. Yeah, I mean, so... So right now we've we've made the conscious decision as you know the whole centrist project to only get behind people running as independents. So even if even if there's more moderate Republicans or Democrats right now, we we won't support them. That's that's a decision they made at the at the national level. Um, in terms of policies, so I mean social tolerance. I, I don't I don't think there's there's much wiggle room around there. I mean you know LGBTQ rights. Um, you know things like support support for gay marriage um, so though that's you know clearly left-wing environmental responsibility I, I think that's another obvious left-wing one um, and then probably the other one I mean good government good governance is I think that's just gener more general 
economic opportunity that's kind of two-pronged. So, I mean, you've got, we believe in strong safety nets that cover everybody, but at the same, so that's more left-wing, but at the same time, we're, we're big uh, proponents of the free market. And so, you know, depending on where on the left you're talking about that, you know, some people might not be behind that, but like, you know, the, I would say for like the um, mainstream Democrat, they, they would agree with that, but probably more with the, the Bernie Democrats, maybe not quite so much. So, uh, thank you. Okay, Braj. I mean, isn't that the problem? Once you start taking those candidates to get elected, they start taking a position on issue, and then problem comes. Okay, yeah, well, then they are, they are neutral, mm -hmm. or they are one side or the other side. Yeah, and you know, that's, that's a big reason why the centrist project made a strategic decision to be the centrist project and not the centrist party. Because if they became a party, you know, they would have to choose these, they would have to choose very specific policies on every issue, and you'd get people who would say, oh, I don't like that one, I'll just default to what I want. And so, instead, we want to be more of an infrastructure. So independents can pursue whatever policies they want within our guardrails. And then, if people don't like them, they don't like them, and you can vote for another candidate. But the, the big thing is just getting different ideas. I mean, I don't know, regardless, if, even if I hated a candidate, I think I would really like the ability to vote for a candidate who has some ideas that are not straight Republican Party line, not straight Democrat Party line. I, I don't know. I would, I would just like the, the choice. And I, I, don't, I think choice is better regardless. I mean, you know, the more choices, the better. Even if you have a candidate who doesn't, who doesn't do so well, uh, you know, I mean, I, I, think it's, I think it's ridiculous that I go into votes and my options are, you know, choose this circle and that, that's it for every single one, one circle for every single office all the way down the ballot. You know, I, that is so frustrating to me. Um, and I mean, that's a, that's a big reason why after the election I started doing this stuff. It's, I was just like, this, this isn't an election, you know? It's, it's, it's where, you know, a political party puts somebody up that they like and I, I get the honor of checking their name. So um, that was really frustrating for me. Did you even bother voting? I didn't bother voting. I just can't. You don't have to answer that. Yeah, no, I, I, I voted. You did vote. I, I voted, and I, uh, a, uh, a, a single tear of shame rolled down my cheek as I walked out. <laughs> Do you reach out to any existing, like, Angus supplement to try to get them to associate with your project or no? Uh, existing people. Okay, yeah, I mean, the, the, I haven't, but, no, the, no, yeah, the yeah, the, the Centrist Project as an organization yeah. has. We've got a lot of people on our side. Um, I think they've made a conscious effort to, you know, kind of, kind of like, like you said earlier, like we, we have Alaska as a bit of a proof of, of concept, but it's a, it's Alaska. I mean, I, like, I, I'm not going to say you're, you're totally wrong. I think it proves a little, but you can only prove so much because it is very different from a lot of the other, you know, contiguous states. So, um, because of that, we're focusing a lot on our proof of concept in, in Colorado. So, Charlie. Yeah, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a hardcore Democrat, and I know where the Democrats stand on the issues. Mm -hmm. Why should I go to you guys? I don't have any idea what you guys are going to do tomorrow. Yeah, because it's really about the individual candidates. It's not. It's not about us. Like, no, you're not going to see a candidate who's running. You know, it's. You know, you're not going to see on an. Wait a minute. We vote at the block in the summer. We gotta. Well, I mean, you know, not we have we have our general guardrails, but even every individ every individual is free to vote however they want. So they won't necessarily vote as a block. Well, I actually the same thing. I mean, I, when you started out describing what you did, I was saying, okay, so you do all the things that the political party does with the organization and the structure, and then you started talking about having guardrails, and most of these most of these issues. The devil's in the details. If you ask most, even the, the furthest out right-wing Republicans, if they think we should be environmentally responsible, they will all say yes. It's just what what constitutes responsible. And that could be anything from, I want to limit the growth of dirty coal-fired power plants to a reasonable amount of growth, 
all the way to I want to eliminate them and go to completely in renewables. Okay. So saying I want to be environmentally, I'm being environmentally responsible, I, I don't know if that means anything. And so you're talking about creating these sort of, this fulcrum, and yeah. you know, is your fulcrum going to be a marshmallow? You know, you, how are you, you either have to have something solid, or you have to be totally relaxed and freewheeling, and it sounds like you're kind of trying to be both. Yeah, I mean, you know, as far as the organization, the Centrist Project goes, like, we're not going to tell people how to vote specifically, but I think there is something to say to having people who aren't tied to either political party, so they can work among the, both political parties to figure out something, to figure out solutions that are, you know, based on science. Okay. So if I deviate too far to one side there, are you going to not support me when I run for re-election? If, if someone if someone is outside of those guardrails, then yeah. Well, I'm not outside of them. I'm just toward one side. Okay. Sorry. Right. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So I mean, we we are big on being following the facts, being based on data. So you know, if you've got people who are you know, so we're getting a little too in the weeds, I think. But if you're talking about something like climate change, you know, if you've got people who are you know, picking and choosing studies that are not, you know, peer reviewed in large journals and doing things like that, uh, then yeah, I think we would say that's not, that's not environmental responsibility. Okay. All right, I have a quick question. Ed, you uh, obviously are the head of the Chicago chapter. You've gone to a lot of organizations. I'm just curious how many hours you spend a week and just a little bit of a background on, your, on how you got into this. Yeah, so I got into it to start because, um, you know, I, I saw a lot of low-hanging fruits, a lot of things that just, just aren't dealt with. I mean, things, things that everyone will admit to that we're just doing nothing about, you know, and so I was like, I don't understand why it's not being done. I don't understand why political parties are saying one thing and doing another. I don't understand why we can't work together and say that, you know, uh, doing nothing about Social Security is okay. You know, I, I just, I didn't understand why we couldn't solve a lot of these problems, even if we have slight differences. You know, just understanding that doing nothing is the worst solution. And so I started looking for groups that were willing to work together that weren't so ide ideologically pure that they couldn't do any, come up with any solutions, and also looking for groups that, um, that weren't tied to one of the two big parties, because I thought the two big parties were too involved with money. So, I, I don't want to get off on a tangent, no, but... No, no, I'm just, I was just curious, because you had mentioned you'd switch jobs and, yeah. and, and a number yeah. of things, and it's just... I, I was frustrated, and I, and I sought them out, because I, I really liked what they had to say. I liked mm -hmm. that, you know, they were emphasizing following facts, that we can work together on things, that we, we don't need to just be um, ideologically pure, and also the idea that there were big, there were systemic problems. It wasn't just, you know, I think a lot of people want to demonize individuals and government, and, and I see it as more of a systemic problem, and, and I like that too. And also just looking, quite frankly, Thank just you. looking around, uh, every, every group I was finding was either, you know, Republican, Democrat, or some subsegment of one of the two, and, and so that was frustrating for me. Okay. Uh, what would be an example of uh, where you're at the guardrail? You know, I don't know. I, I don't want to get. I don't want to get into the specifics because honestly, those are all set. Those are all set by the national group, and so I don't. I don't want to speak for them in terms of what what is permissible and what's not. Um, I mean, you know, I think where a lot of that relies is things like coming up with policies and being able to pay for it. So, I mean, that's, you know, as far as fiscal responsibility. But I, I really, I don't want to put words in the, t the top leadership's mouth on a lot of these other things. Um, but that, that's a good question. So I'm not, I'm not trying to sidestep it. I just, I just don't want to speak for them because I, under I understand there could be some nuance. All right. A lot of them. Way in the back. Hi. What's your uh, Stand up. five point plan to get money out of politics? I think that has to be transparent. Five point plan to get money out of politics? Well, you can do over three. Mike, can you stand up and speak up? 
What's your what's your multi point plan yeah, okay. to get money out of politics, yeah, yeah. super PACs, dark money? Uh, so I think the, the inference is that anyone involved in politics is trying to make money. No, he I, wants, I don't I don't I don't right? Is that, is he that wants to know what specific like proportions are. Why are you gonna get money out of politics? Like if some mass murderer is funding some presidential candidate. Uh -huh. I want to know what you think. I want to get to know that. Uh, yeah, I'm, 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 I'm not sure. How do you, what, will, what will your group do? Yeah, I mean, I can, I can speak for the Chicago chapter. Um, I can speak for myself. I get, I get five bucks a month, uh, which is probably shouldn't see. No, no, I'm not making myself clear. I'm sorry. What was, what is their plans to make a transfer to get rid of super pack? Transparency and show who's funding who. How, how are they going to maintain transparency? Is that, is that your question? He wants to know what proposals you have to get money out of politics. Um, yeah. I mean, if there's anything that you specifically know that the centrist. Oh, yeah, yeah. I, I'm, I'm just not sure. I mean, the, as far as fundraising and all that goes, I don't, I don't have anything to do with that. I've, I've asked in general um, who their donors are. It's, it's a mix of random people like me who are passionate um, and entrepreneurs um, so uh, not that's, your, that's no, a, not your money not not your group national group oh how how are we going to get how are you going to fix the mo problem of money oh, in politics at a problem. national level <laughs> super PACs and dark money our election. yeah oh i'm i'm not sure as far as far as the specifics of the national chapter and what and what their ideas are I have a question. I have a question. Um, does your group address the nationwide program right now by the Trump administration <laughs> and governors all over the country to pass more legislation to suppress the poll movement? To keep you know, to, they're, they're removing voters from the rolls in like 34 states, Democratic voters. There's a massive voter suppression uh, action going on right now to change the ability of <laughs> Democrats, basically, to, to actually get to the polls and vote. Their names are being removed from the rolls in 34 states. It's called the cross-check program. What uh, does your your group talk about that at all? Voter suppression in America. Yeah, I mean, you know, a, a lot of these questions. It's it's kind of you know, centrist project as a as a national group is more concerned with electing independents, and then it would be it would be the independents who are concerned about those sorts of things. So. I mean, I can tell you our chapter specifically, like we're we're concerned about policies that try to, you know, suppress the number of voters. So, like, we want we think more voters is better. Um, but yeah, I, I can't speak for for national policies. I, I know it, it's 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 not something that the centrist project focuses. You know, it's not a focus of the group. Charlie. Uh, yeah, you had a chart, Matthew, there, alleging that. The vast majority of Americans are dissatisfied with the government. Uh -huh. What exactly does, does that mean? Are they dissatisfied with paying taxes? Are they dissatisfied because they were fined? Are they dissatisfied about the candidates? Yeah. Are they dissatisfied about elected officials? Yeah. I mean, so you, it's your graph. Tell me which of those it might be. And I could name half a dozen more. So what are they really dissatisfied? Now the other thing is, when they asked people, we did a survey, we had people stand outside the federal building and state buildings and city buildings, and as they were leaving, they said, are you satisfied with the activity that took place inside that brought you this building? 98% said they were satisfied. Yeah, I mean, this. so this is really around trust. Um, so it's, you know, do people trust their government? So I mean, I, I'm sure there are a whole bunch of reasons people don't trust their government, but I think the more general idea is that it's, it's sad that so few people trust their government. And so we, we tried to understand why that was and that people would elect people that they so deeply distrust. And that's why we came up with a lot of systemic reasons that we're trying to combat. Let's get ready to go to uh, rebuttals now. Give our speaker a hand. Okay.
Okay, we will start the rebuttal period now uh, to give an idea of how much time everybody's got. Uh, let's have a show of hands. Raise your hand if you would like to give a rebuttal to tonight's speech. Uh, keep your hands up so we can get an accurate count. Uh, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, and eight. So everybody gets uh, four minutes apiece, uh, like about normal. Okay, who's going to be first to come up here and give the first rebuttal? I'll do it, Andy. Okay. You can give a rebuttal to the speaker or say a few words on the world situation, uh, whatever you feel comfortable with. All right. Thank you. I mean, hey, Wes. I like what you're doing with the centrist project. The problem is, I don't think you're going to develop enough of an agreeable coalition to do just that. The system of political parties and of candidates has been around for a long time. And probably in recent history, one of the most, a lot of your arguments are probably delivered by one of the more successful third parties that were at the, at the last presidential election. And that is the candidate Gary Johnson and Bill Weld from the Libertarian Party. They were on the ballot in all 50 states. They were starting to get statewide organizations going. They're starting to get a bunch of on the ballot continuously in many of the states. Now I'm not saying that you know it's not a good thing but I'm sure you've been to a few libertarian rallies am I correct? Uh, did you ever speak to the Fox Valley Libertarians? Oh I'll have to inform you about that. There's a good group that meets in a, in a second floor of a tavern down in Dundee once a month and they're usually about a hundred people plus down there and a lot of times they're really excited because for the first time many of the voters are agreeing with them. Your six pillars are basically what they're about in a lot of ways. And I keep thinking to myself, you know, maybe you're just reduplicating the wheel with the centrist project. Now I'm not trying to, to knock your work because it, it, you're getting a chapter started, getting a regular meeting space running, Getting a regular group of people together to agree on anything is quite a work and an, an, an endeavor. I should know I'm very active with a group called Toastmasters International, helping form clubs. We just recently split. But if you really, I think, want to get this third party thing going and get some people in there, it, it's almost essential that you get a little bit more, more of a political party aspect to it. You know, here's what we support. Here's what we do. The very same strategy that you've talked about with the fulcrums and the whole bit in Alaska is exactly what the libertarians are saying. If we get a libertar cut few libertarians in Congress, we'll be able to affect the things. As a matter of fact, in a recent book by Thomas Friedman and uh, I think it was called and that was, and them that was a the story of us, how we can make America great. It was done by Thomas Friedman and I trying the other guys escaping my name right now, but they said the most effective way to make any effective political change in our country is with the third parties, because that means the other two have to more clearly delineate themselves. The last time we seen any kind of real truth to this was with the, uh, was when Perot ran for office against Bush 2 and Clinton. <laughs> And there, and, and believe it or not, he was right up there with the uh, on debate on point. But Clinton had to more redirect himself. Bush had to more redirect himself. I know his party kind of petered out after the one election, but the last time too that we had that much what that much significant political change was at the Boo Moose Party and Teddy Roosevelt. Again, both political parties saw the threat of competition coming. They couldn't keep their little duopoly going, and that's why they were able to do it. And what you're talking about is the same thing, you know. But again, you're going to have to get that fundamental structure in and down. When I saw your thing, you, you've got a link on the national website. You know, Facebook's one thing, but you do need a web presence as well as a Twitter. I mean, there's a little bit more emphasis on social media today than there's been in the past. But don't forget, there's still a lot of people who still just look at the WWWs of the world. 
Good luck. I think it's a good idea what you're doing. But again, I would like to see you take a look at some of the other structures already in place and not reinvent the wheel because it's already been invented. Why should they look at crazy libertarians? Huh? Why should they look at loony libertarians? Uh, uh, sure the thank the speaker. I thought it was an interesting uh, talk. Uh, please give me a notice of 30 seconds yep. or something. Okay, uh, but I'm going to take my time to talk about movement politics at Jane Addams Senior Caucus. Actually, Jane Addams Senior Caucus is a 501c3, but we form Jane Addams Seniors in Action. It's a 501c4. We can endorse candidates. So on Monday, we're going to have a meeting of movement politics. It's Monday, it's 11 a.m., it's at 1111 North Wells, and what are we going to talk about? We're going to talk about our governor. We are tired of our governor. So what we're going to do is endorse somebody in the Democratic primary, which will take place next spring, and how will we do that? Well. We believe in democracy. We have members and we have meetings. And at those meetings, we talk about what we want. And what we want is, on the state level, people and planet first budget. We want to make sure that we tax the people who've got the money. And we want to make sure we give services to those who need it. That's the people and planet first budget. So, how are we going to decide on a candidate? There are 10, 11 of them running. We're putting out a questionnaire. How do we decide on the questionnaire? Well, democratically. We sat down and said, what questions will we ask? So, we're going to endorse a candidate in the primary. 99 chance out of 100, that candidate will not win the primary. But we will endorse that candidate and work for that candidate. How will we work for that candidate? We're going to go out, we're going to make phone on the phone, and we're going to go door to door. So if you're interested in this sort of a thing, this would be a time that you could get uh, active. And we believe in movement <laughs> politics. Movement politics is a form of community organizing, specialized form of community organizing in which we use elections as catalysts to uh, build on our issues and win, uh, win on our issues and build our organization. Of course, our issues are the issues of half the people here. We want Social Security. We want to make sure that uh, our seniors are taken care of and that, uh, and that our planet is taken care of. So if you're interested in this sort of thing, come Monday, Monday, 11 a.m., 1111 North Wells, first floor, movement politics. You don't have to be a member to be there. Thank you. All right. Be there Monday, 11, 1111 North Wells. Late last night, uh, I was watching the new de development uh, in technology, and there was news that they are going to have a food that doesn't require refrigeration, and you can eat, and it, it will last for it, it can stay fresh for one year. The first question came to my mind is that how many people will be unemployed in the refrigeration industry? Second, second thing came out is that. And Amazon's uh, stores are not going to have any employees. It was an employee-free store. That uh, there will be no servers, nothing. So these are the issues. Now, now let me tell you something. Poli political. What you guys are talking about? 
political system, democracy, it's over. It's not going to be there anymore. Look at Donald Trump. He's virtually a dictator. Okay, either his way or no way. No matter what, everything goes on, but I mean, still, he's a dictator. And he, he may be crazy, he may be mean, he may, may not understand much, still he calls the sides. Now look about who, who is going to run for president. Do you know lots of techn technology rich people, they're lining up. They want to be president of the United States. Okay, how do how you think they're going to run? They, they, they know the technology, they know how to control change, they know how to control news, they know how to control people, they know how to control, uh, they are smart enough to write a legislation better than our legislature can do it. And this, this is the real issue. I don't think you, you guys are talking about democracy or party and let's do this, then it's not going to work. I don't think, I, I do not think it's going to work. What we have problem is that right now, and it, maybe it will be for good. Lots of our congressmen, senators, and state and federal level, they, they are not knowledgeable. They don't have no knowledge. They do not understand the issues. They do, not, they do not understand their own people even. And we are saying that in a, in a town, hall, town hall meeting, we are saying that every day, every, all the time. People do not understand. And do you know something, second thing, it's not all their fault. Issues have become so complex that the average person cannot understand. Now most people you are talking about running as independent, you know, first thing I think everybody should do before they think about politics ever, travel all over the country before they have any, any, any name recognition. And go to small town, go, go to far away, go to central city. But they, they, nobody had done that. This, these people get in a politics out of nowhere and they think they are smart. And they don't know the people, poor people, they don't know rich people. You know, last, last Monday, I, I stood in a, for, for a, what do you call it, this a soup kitchen, where people don't know, are hungry, they, they go and eat at a, at a Jewish, Jewish uh, temple. And I talked to lots of them. And do you know what they really wanted? They wanted decent meal to eat. And they said, this, do you know what they say? That this place is the best meal in the city. Then I asked, where do they go? Everybody, every day there is somewhere free food available. So these are the issues. And I don't think our, our people, our legislature, either state or city or county, understand what are the issues. Okay, and like it or not, technology is coming. These technologically rich people are coming. They are driving everything. New York, New York City philosophical base is all controlled by them. Thank you. Next. Yeah, go ahead. Is the microphone just, turned on? Mike, it's the battery's dead back there. So what? Just, just speak up. Yeah, people can oh, hear you. It's quiet. Okay. Uh, what I would like to say about Matthew's presentation is that it's extremely inspiring. It's really wonderful to see somebody, a young person at all, who really wants to do something, who's taken a part-time job versus a full-time job to be able to pursue this goal. An idealistic person, and I respect him. And there are very few people that I do respect. Uh, I would also like to point out, I would like to uh, refer to the question about um, uh, getting money out of elections. Now, the known, it's a known fact that the way to do that is to have public funding of elections, which we did have for presidential elections until Obama threw them out, threw this out, and he uh, got out from under it so he could spend as much money as he could. But the fact is, we did have a public funding system for presidential elections until he ruined it. So he didn't need public funding. Okay. All right. I found your pro your, your talk to be very interesting. However, it strikes me that it's one of those things that looks good on paper. Louder. Speak up a little. That looks good on paper, but I don't know how well it will work in reality. First, you used Alaska as a model, and by your own admission. That's not that great a model. Alaska is a small state where everybody knows everybody else, and where each of its citizens is a very individualistic person. I mean, 
some years ago, in 1980, they had commercials for the Libertarian Party on television, and they showed the scenes of the Libertarian Party having its national convention, um, in which a guy by the name of Ed Clark was nominated for president. And the leader of the Alaska delegation rose to cast his state's vote. He said, Alaska, the land of the individual and other endangered species. Well, that's pretty much how they think up there in Alaska. Second, you spoke of gerrymandering. Now, granted, my bias is different from yours. I am a lifelong Chicago and Cook County Democrat. I make no apologies for that. However, people didn't complain about gerrymandering when the Republicans ran the legislature. It was only when the Democrats finally took over that they began screaming about gerrymandering. So I think that's basically a Republican issue, and I have always thought so. Um, and that's it. Thank you. Okay. Next. Who's next? Somebody had their hand up. Well, come on up, Oh, okay. okay. Somebody's coming. Come on up. Thanks in your seatbelt, too. Uh, uh, good, oh my God. Uh, good evening. Uh, we think that that's a centrist uh, position is a panacea, but nothing grows on the middle. Middle. You have to go to the left or right, like on the road. You have to step left or right. When I was young, I was probably 90% liberal and 10% conservative. Nobody's 100% liberal or conservative. <clears throat> and, uh, uh, okay. And I said a few months ago that, uh, I heard somewhere that, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, <clears throat> that if you're conservative at 20, you never uh, live because lib <clears throat> liberals are a risk. Conservatives are more cautious. Mm -hmm. And if you're a liberal at 40 or plus, you never grew up in a certain sense. The more older you get, the more conservative you get. Now you mentioned that the, uh, Obama, uh, or uh, Trump won. Now Trump, uh, <clears throat> never in the history of America has anybody been hated as Trump. You, you always wanted somebody that was not a lawyer. Finally you got somebody that is not a lawyer. Uh, you, you hate his guts. Uh, okay. <clears throat> oh, excuse me. And once I uh, we had a uh, 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 the left or right, none of the above. Once it was you hear socialism or uh, or tyranny, just somebody said none of the above. But if you were, had a choice between socialism and uh, a tyranny, a tyranny, ninety nine ninety five percent or more would say socialism. But the, in a certain sense, you're better off with a tyranny because uh, you know what, what's going on. Now in socialism. It's like a frog, you know, nice warm water, and cool water, and it gets hotter and hotter, and finally, that the, third, uh, that the frog gets the goose cooked. And in the social we can have our goose cooked. And I, I say once, uh, Thomas Aquinas, uh, the whole Catholic Church is built upon uh, Aquinas, his philosophy and theology, and Aquinas said the, the best leader is a good, old, wise king. Good old wise king and kings are ty 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 tyrants. They're good tyrants or good ty uh, bad evil ty tyrants. But the best leader is a good old wise king. And uh, oh, uh, last week I asked this uh, a black man, an elderly black man, and he voted for Hillary. He says no way. I said how come? He says uh, uh, Trump is once the. Uh, Keep America as uh, supreme. I mean, keep her uh, empire here. Now, <clears throat> okay. Now, uh, now uh, you got uh, a minute left. Here, a minute. Yeah. Okay. Uh, <clears throat> excuse me. <clears throat> now, uh, how would uh, how would Obama uh, uh, treat the, the North Kore Koreans? How would he treat them? He'd probably send a Dennis Rodman over to, sh to play basketball because. Uh, the uh, tyrant over in North Carolina, Korea, he's crazy about the Rodman's basketball uh, show voting. Period. <clears throat> what? 
Obama? I keep sending the, uh, Dennis Robin, Robin over there. Oh, here, they, they, they hate, uh, now, uh, Obama, he hated the Jews, because he's a Muslim. Oh, come on. And when, uh, yeah, yeah, he, his father was a Muslim, he went to Muslim school, he's a Muslim. And Net when Netanyahu, Netanyahu came over, he treated Netanyahu in the way of shamefully. He treated him shamefully. Yes, he did. Netanyahu had to, had to go to the backyard to get out of there. He just ignored Netanyahu. Uh, and he hates. Um, I just sent Netanyahu to the outhouse. <laughs> he hates the British. I don't know if you know, but the first day in the, in the White House, uh, Obama. Uh, yeah, Obama. He sent the bust of uh, Winston Churchill back to uh, uh, England. And he hates America. Why? I had it here. Oh, about the the, the, the cars. All those good, good looking, good cars. He scrap them all. You have to get the, his type of cars. What's terrible about that? There's a lot of cars here. Oh. Here is a good old white king. Yeah. A little ragged there. Yeah, well, you're back to the cars. Okay, let's get back on track here, people. Uh, I'm looking for a new car. <laughs> the Korean car is the Korean car is on its last leg. Anyway, well, um, sounded like a good show here, and I really think you ought to get onto the uh, bandwagon of uh, reforming our elections. I think it's we had a really terrific speaker here several weeks ago, and he was a PhD and an accountant. And accountants don't take any shit. Are you an accountant? Yeah, so that's good. <laughs> you guys play it by the rules. Anyway, so it's pretty obvious that um, with the election machines, electronic, uh, all this dark money, money in politics, super PACs, uh, the big media, the big info. Our election, we got to look at our election system because uh, it's just. I think the American people are fed up with it. So. Yeah, political power is best achieved through the end of a barrel of a gun. <laughs> well, I don't know if we want to reform it that way. Oh, this guy did. <laughs> All right, but I think we got things are a little different in the last 200 years. Things have changed, so. Really? I, yeah. And the free what about market that guy in Argentina? Control. Huh? What about that clown in Argentina? Anyway, so, um, so I lost the train of thought. Uh, <laughs> anyway, so it's time to, you know, the free market's been running the election system uh, big time now, and I think there's big problems with that. They so, could learn from something from Chicago politics. What's that? Yeah. <laughs> Get out of here. You haven't talked already. <laughs> All right, so, yeah, so yeah, I think you guys should go be, re be election reformers. Uh, top to bottom. Everything's got to be looked at again. You know, money, <coughs> machines, networking, information, money, uh, uh, big media, all that. So, all right. Well, good luck. Okay. Honorary Christian there. soldiers. <laughs> all right. Andy, I got you. Don't worry. I'd like to thank our speaker tonight for... Uh, thought-provoking. I'd like to mention uh, three basic categories that I think will help. Uh, number one, uh, there's a news site uh, that's a favorite of Bill Moyers and a bunch of other people that call themselves progressives. That site is called Common Dreams. CommonDreams.org. Uh, it's the best news site that I know of for giving you mainstream progressive news. They're talking about beneficial things that are people are doing all over the country and all over the world. Uh, Common Dreams is the exact opposite of the mainstream news where uh, on the radio, on almost every radio station, every time there's a news break, you get some piece of crime somewhere and then the stock market. It's crime in the stock market all day long. And there's no time left to tell us about the good things that are going on everywhere. Uh, another site is called Truth Out. It's run by William River Spitt. He's a retired uh, school teacher. 
they have a, a bunch of the best articles on the environment. There's a guy named Dar Jamail that publishes a, like an 11 or 12 page article, a summary of what's happening with global warming and climate change. That's the best site that I know of. Those two sites post the best of the best of progressive news where our, our speaker is talking about centrist things that will appear to most, appear to, uh, well, uh, make sense to most people with common sense from, from any political party. And then lastly, uh, we have to recognize right now uh, Trump is giving us, uh, we're in the six months into the 17th year of Bush Cheney crimes. Uh, a, a corporate criminal uh, combine took over the American government, passed the Patriot Act and the Homeland Security Act uh, early in the administration, right after 9-11. 9-11 uh, was used to pass those two things that eliminated any constitutional or legal rights for anybody in America who was not a billionaire with their own private security force. So as long as the Patriot Act and Homeland Security are on the books, we have no constitutional rights in America. Any one of us could be arrested, disappeared into a black hole somewhere without a phone call. This is one of the reasons why a lot of people are not protesting uh, that would be out in the streets if, if they weren't so afraid of getting arrested by the secret police in America. There are, you know, the huge multi-billion dollar budget of what's called Homeland Security. We didn't have any of that before 9-11. And if you want to understand voting rights in this country, I would suggest looking at the number one analyst uh, in the world of voting rights, voting suppression. The man's name is Greg Pallast, and he has his own site. It's Greg Pallast, uh, he has produced a book, uh, in a, you can watch a DVD, it's called The Best Democracy Money Can Buy. And he talks about all the ways that right-wing criminals masquerading as Republican governors have been suppressing the vote all across the country. We haven't had an honest election in this country since the year 2000. The electronic voting machines, uh, supposedly to solve the problem of the hanging chads in Florida, we got electronic machines in 2002. Is that Greg Pallast? Yeah, this is Greg Pallast right here. Okay. Uh, his work is the very best talking about uh, voter, voting suppression and what to do about it. But, you know, we teach seventh graders, in order to solve any problem, you have, must have first have to correctly, correctly identify the problem and then correctly identify the solution. And this is what the website Common Dreams talks about. If you forget about political parties and say, do you think we should have affordable health care, 99% of the people say, yeah, I'd like to have affordable health care. I don't want to have to sell my house to pay for a sick child. And so that's just one example. But start logging into the common dreams every day and forget about the mainstream news media and you have a totally different opinion, uh, awareness of what's going on in the world. Okay. Mr. Charlie Paydock. All right, thanks, Andy. Andy's going to be speaking on September 9th. He's going to tell us, how do you, how do you explode thermite? You paint it on and then what? Well, yeah, I don't know. That's, that's a side issue. All right, we'll find out September. That's a side issue. <laughs> Not important. All right, thank you very much, Matt Jet Singer, speaker again. As we did, I'll be eclectic and talk about a number of issues here. Um, I'll begin by making a declaration that I am a uh, a hardcore Democrat, and I feel no reform is necessary for the Democratic Party. I like their positions, I like the candidates that they put forth, and I feel no great sense of dissatisfaction regarding it. Um, the, I've been involved as, as Wes with the there's things when you get into reforming politics, reform, well, reform, I like reform <laughs> politics, uh, the Independent Voters of Illinois, which has one approach of endorsing candidates of either party that they think has merit. Uh, another approach, pretty much the same thing, 
is the Vote Smart organization, which endorses candidates who they ascertain to have merit. Any member of associations, like these renegade seniors here of Gene, uh, put out voter guides endorsing candidates that they think have merit. There's um, now is election politics um, perfect? I'd say the only sense that I can ascertain that um, I might see some measure of improvement is the expense involved in putting together a viable campaign. However, there is a benefit to that in the sense that you only have genuinely, genuinely serious candidates uh, running for office. That's the first thing we do when we give endorsements in IVI, is we don't look at any issue, except one thing at the very first, is that candidate put together a viable campaign. Without having done so, you have no chance whatsoever to get elected. And the same thing I ask of the central party, are you capable of putting up viable campaigns, viable candidates? Once when I've been involved in the Green Party since its inception, not all the time that they put it. Matter of fact, I would say almost very rarely Almost never, and I've had them, we've had them here. I must say this at the Green Party, a third party, we just haven't put together candidates who are viable. Some of them aren't even, aren't even logical. I, I'm sorry, they're just not qualified to cross the street, let alone operate the, the government. I'm sorry, putting together a third party is not easy. Uh, you know, it's like at the last convention I was at, the guy that spoke here, what's his name, uh, that passed on, he said, what is this, some kind of just feel good organization? Where are we electing candidates? Or it's just kind of like feel good, you know, like we're doing something here, you know? Uh, are we really accomplishing anything? And you get like one or two percent of the vote. Now, there's one thing I noticed here in the great game plan of the Central Party is that. The Central Party has effectiveness only if, if the legislative body is split exactly down the middle. <coughs> if it's tilted to either side, and I'm not done a study of this, but the Central Party electing candidates to legislative assembly where there's a it's not evenly divided means they have actually virtually no effectiveness. So that's what you're talking about. Now why should I, why, that, you, you, you said, well, well, we're going to be carefully select. You know, the reason I think you're only selecting five states is because there's only five states where you might be effective. Uh -huh. um, not to say that's not worth a try. I think you, such a, the real contribution would be to what extent do you improve the general level of conversation in the campaigns? Um, the strategy of uh, winning or losing is pretty narrow scope in this sense because you can't, I don't know, what kind of party can you operate when you just kind of show up and disappear? And I, have you thought about that? How do you build an organization? Um, we've had wild swings in the U.S. Congress, um, sometimes in, in the number of, of, of representatives that belong into one party or another. What would happen to the Central Party if, like in 94, where the Republicans got significant. Was you, you know, Charlie, I wonder why you're talking about precinct organizations and the viability of candidates and yet your own IVI IPO websites two months out of date. I said, I, as a matter of fact, I'm the harshest critic of the Illinois Green Party. What does that say? If you've ever had a bad day, go to admitting of the Illinois Green Party. 
Because that's the most assembled ragtag lot. Yes. I just gave you a statement that I said, is this a feel-good party? Activities. And it said, yeah, we've had our, our moments. <laughs> we accused of uh, taking away the presidential election with Ralph Nader. Uh -huh. And in other cases, in other senses, did. they're not really viable. They are successful in the sense that they decided to put together a nation. Here's the centrist they have done. The Greens are lesson for you. They said, we've got to put together, we want to run nationwide candidates for president. It requires an independence party in each of the 50 states. And you have to put it together, and putting together a political party ain't just like you, you decide to do it and it's done the next day. We actually did do it. Now you come along and you got to get candidates on the ballot. That's no mean accomplishment. Not only did we get on the ballot, we got on the ballot for the next five or ten years, which you libertarians, I hate to tell you, ain't never achieved. So there, pal, adios. Adios. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, the speaker gets the last word. Speaker gets the last word. Sure. All right. Thanks. Thanks again for having me. Um, I'll, I'll make it quick. I, you know, I, I think um, there are a couple of key things. So the, the first one is is just in general, um, an acknowledgement that that now is a different time in history. You know, I mean, you talk to a lot of people, there's, there's a different feel to this past election. You know, there's, there's something different. I feel like we're ready for something different. So that's, that's the first thing. The second thing is, you know, just, just to clear up a lot of the confusion, it's not, it's not a political party. We're not, we're not trying to put together a political party. And one of the big reasons behind that, so a, a, there are a lot of comparisons to other third parties and what they've done and, and why this might not be able to work because of what they've done that hasn't worked. But the, the truth is, the problem with the political party is, you know, they're, the third parties are trying to run as many candidates as they can, and they, they keep losing, and quite, they're associated with losing now. You know, if we, if we have an infrastructure, we can continue to support individuals. And if an individual loses, that's okay. It doesn't, it doesn't reflect on our brand, because we can find some other individuals. And we're being really selective. So, you know, you, you said, it is true, the fulcrum strategy won't work everywhere. That's why, you know, every state is not a priority. That is, that is the reason why we're focusing only on a couple states. But, so the first thing, we're focusing on Colorado because it's split fairly evil, evenly, Democrat and Republican, and there's a good amount of independents there and moderates. So, so that is, that was strategically picked. But I think, I think that speaks more to its viability, that we're being strategic about where we're running and where we're choosing to put our money and have an impact. You know, we're not, we're not going for president, and we, quite frankly, we never will until we get a few senators elected, because we have no chance. You know, you have no chance of, you know, outside the main parties because of the electoral system for president. Um, so, you know, I think we're very different from a normal third party. It, it's more of an infrastructure, and I think it can continue, can continue to grow, um, you know, once, once we, once we prove that the fulcrum strategy can work from, from start to end with the state, we're really, our end goal is the Senate. So, I mean, once we could do it on the federal level, that's when we we'll really have some power. Um, I think there's a lot to be said, though, even within individual states. So, that's all I have to say. Thank, thanks for, uh, right. for sticking around. All right. Hey. Hey. Thank you. Now they're not a party. Right, thanks. Vote for Monarchy. Okay. Uh, <laughs> right, thanks a lot, We're adjourned. Uh, we'll see you all next week. Thank you for coming. And uh, drive safely going home. Or ride safely if you use public transportation. Walk safely also. Take it easy. Okay, that's it. Tim? Can I get a